Hello, welcome to Microfiche Microphone. I'm Micah, and on this channel we look at microfiche from the past, old newspaper articles in the public domain. We look at them with our modern eyes, our modern perspective, and see what we can learn from them. On this microfiche time capsule, we are looking back at the Ladies Home Journal from January 1901. So we looked at another article from this one, but this one is a little bit shorter and it is called The Well-Dressed Woman at Middle Age. So this is kind of a fashion advice column and original designs by Virginia Louis Ralston and drawings by Jeanette Hope. So clothing designer and the artist. So um, I was just thinking this would be fun because these are obviously very different than what we wear today. But I just wanted to see what the fashions were back then and see uh, what they had to say about them. Thought that would be fun. The styles this winter are singularly adapted to all ages and to most women, possibly because they are largely a revival of old fashions. Yeah, fashions do come around again, don't they? Indeed, one of the leading dressmakers of Paris has been quoted as saying recently that nothing is a good fashion unless it is a revival of an old idea. All the soft finished materials are most popular, the darker co colors, yeah, darker colors being decidedly preferred, except perhaps the grays. A touch of gold is absolutely indispensable, but one must be cherry. Oh, that's another, I'm not sure how to pronounce this word, because I had another article that had the same word in it, and I'm just not sure how it's pronounced. So. It means cautiously or suspiciously reluctant to do something. Cherry, like like cherry tree, yeah? Okay, so cherry is apparently correct. So cautiously or suspiciously reluctant to do something. Okay, real reluctant, yeah? So it's not that far off of wary, yeah? I wonder why, I wonder where it came from. Okay, so the difference between wary and cherry. If you're a little suspicious of something and mulling it over, you're being cherry. A synonym of cherry is wary, and both include caution, but some definitions suggest it's obvious. When someone is wary, it shows. While being cherry is more of an inside or hidden distrust. There you go. That is the difference between the two words. I'm actually wondering about its etymology. Uh, like, where in the world did this word come from? Or origin, it's old West Germanic, Old English, chirig, chirig or care, hmm. chirig, careful, anxious, of West German origin related to care. The current sense arose in the mid 16th century. Okay, sorrowful, full of care. All right. So I guess it was carry at the beginning, you know. Except some people would pronounce it then cherry. Interesting. I, I I got off a side tangent, but like that that word is just annoying me because I had never heard it before. I know it's not used today. I know it's antiquated, but still, like I feel like I should know what it means. <laughs> All right, there we go. Okay, a touch of gold is absolutely indispensable. One must be cherry in its use, or the desired effects is lost and is and a tawdry one is given. <laughs> That's funny because I like now they're saying that. You know, if you use too much gold, you'll look tawdry. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, it just reminds me of the people who wear like the really, really fat, like gold chains around their neck. You know, that does have a certain, you know, not quite as elegant and refined as they were going for here. Um, <laughs> you know. A perfectly plain skirt is a thing seldom seen nowadays, but many simple effects are possible by the use of stitched folds of the same material as one's costume. Mm hmm like layers of it. Sleeves play an important part, and the variety of styles for them is great. They are unquestionably larger this season than last, but only below the elbow. Huh, they have like little folds around their, their uh, lower arms. The old-fashioned basque is being revived. It was just, it is just a bodice with a short tail. Mm -hmm. The new bonnets are quite small and very flat, and these are the principal requisites to follow when selecting a new one. Small and flat. Okay, um, 
I think that's interesting. So I'm going to go ahead and show the pictures, the drawings that came in with the article. So um, here's the first one, and it says underneath it, morning gown of cashmere. This dainty house gown is made with a skirt finished with three bias flounces edged with narrow pipings of taffeta. The bodice is plated into shoulder yoke and the sleeves into narrow cuffs. A morning gown? Like... Do you wear that out or is that like a house dress? I'm not sure like what the, you know, rules are. Uh, you can see like the, the style of the time with like kind of slightly puffy sleeves with like the, the cuff on it. Um, that's definitely not really something that we wear today, but I definitely associate it with like early 20th century. Um, like up to the 20s, I would even say, like, and then it had a revival in the 40s, but it hasn't really been fashionable since then. So I'm just saying and that narrow waist, like, looks a little weird. I'm not going to lie. It's like angled too. Hmm. Not sure. All right. Next one. Braided gown of chevoit. The skirt of this chevoit gown is made with a small yoke around the top into which the skirt at each side is plated. The bolero is braided and opens over a tiny vest of pan velvet. Okay. So it's kind of got layers to it. That's a bit fancier, you know? It has like this trim on it, has like this under vest, and I like, guess it's kind of cool looking. All right. Tailor made costume of Zibeline. This stylish tailor made costume is made effective by stitching and braid. The jacket, which opens slightly on the left side, is trimmed with Persian lamb. The skirt is made with two bias flounces. That's more of a going out outfit, you know? I mean, if I were going, you know, to... Uh, I can't even think of an example. I'm going, like, to meet someone for tea or something, you know what I mean? Like, that's like, I've got things to do outfit. So, but it's extreme, like, like if you were very fashionable, you know? Like, it's so stylish. I can't believe, like, did people really wear these every day? Or was there some sort of plainer, like, quote-unquote normal day, every day, like, outfit? I don't know. Like, hmm. if you know, let me know in the comments. Dinner gown trimmed with brocade. This black and white striped silk dinner gown is trimmed with brocade of a pompadour design. The bodice is one of the new dinner coats with vest. The sash is of black satin. Yeah, that's a little fancy, yeah? Like, that's more of a, uh, I'm going out to a special occasion thing, yeah? So they called it a dinner gown. Afternoon gown of cloth. <sighs> Are clothes made of anything other than cloth? I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. So, like, specifically saying of cloth is a little bit odd to me, but okay. The skirt of this gown is made with pla plates, which are stitched to a point below the knees, where they flare into a full ruffle. The bodice is the new short coat with collar and cuffs of velvet. Like, that's an afternoon dress? You know, like you're going to visit a friend kind of a dress. That looks pretty fancy to me. I don't know. Like the velvet on it. Like I would wear that to a party. But I guess they were fancier back then. All right. Street gown of camel camel's hair. I never got the camel hair thing. Okay. The skirt of this street gown is trimmed with velvet and gathered at the top into a yoke. From which it hangs in full folds. The bodice is trimmed with straps folds of the camel's hair. Okay, camel hair specifically refers to the fur from the body of a camel, but more generally refers to the fiber that may be made. Uh, I'm going to cut it off right there. Maybe made from either pure camel hair or a blend of camel hair and another fiber. Okay, so apparently it was a thing back then. I guess it still is in some places. So it's like more leathery, like leather kind of a thing. A street gown. What does it mean? <laughs> like I said, when you're going to run a lot of errands. I guess if it were made from leather, it would be more durable. So, maybe that's why. Like, would you wear a leather dress, though? I don't know. I'm just... Like, something that big. You know? I know people wear leather dresses, but, like... It has to be kind of, like... 
like a smaller kind of a like I think of like a leather skirt as like a like a knee length skirt but I don't think of like a leather dress I don't know I'm you know what I'm just gonna google it <laughs> this is what google is for a leather dress yeah they're like more like form-fitting you know yeah all of them are like none of them because leather doesn't really drape very well like you would think of like a skirt draping you know, like leather dresses are much more form-fitting. All right, um, how about camel hair dress? Okay, so camel hair is not really leathery then. Okay, my bad. Interesting. Like, I've never seen camel's hair, so if you know more about it, please leave a comment below. But slightly weirded out by the fact that they're calling it a street gown. <laughs> okay, moving on. A stylish street gown, because the other one wasn't stylish. I don't know, like, like they, they look very similar to me. <laughs> All right. This cut skirt of this gown is made with a deep knitted, ruff, kilted, kilted? Yeah. Kilted ruffle. The bodice is full and front and, and trimmed with embroidery in it, of an oriental design. It is worn over a vest of silk braided in gold. All right, so that is a bit fancier, but um, because of the gold braid, I guess. Other than that, like it, they look very similar to me. All right, last one. The new Aiglon wrap. I don't know how to pronounce that. The high standing collar of this triple capes of this wrap are finished with stitching. The coat part is plated from the shoulders, the plates being stitched quite flat about halfway down. Okay, so it's more like a jacket. It's that's very ruffly. <laughs> I mean, would you wear wear a ruffly jacket like that? Well, another thing that struck me is how very very long the skirts are. You can't see anybody's feet underneath them, and the trains are very long as well. Like they're they're dragging the floor. So, I was just thinking about that. Like wouldn't that be slightly impractical to have a skirt so long that it's dragging the ground when you walk? I don't know, like, I thought that at this point they had kind of moved on to being slightly more practical with their clothing, but I guess not yet. <laughs> like, like, that's interesting. Like, when, yeah, I'm going to ask Google again. When did skirts stop being floor length? 1890s. See, that's what I said. Okay, the popularity of the skirt as a separate piece of clothing really grew and gained momentum during this time. Stuffy full-length dresses were exchanged for more practical garments. However, skirts still hit the floor, and that continued until the 1910s. Okay, so 1910. That's, uh, that's good, because <laughs> it's very impractical. And then they had, like, the flapper era in the 1920s, and then in the 30s, they just straight up didn't have the fabric. And then in the 40s, it was the war shortages, so they didn't they didn't have fabric then either. And then uh, and then they became longer again in the 50s and 60s, and then they just got shorter again. Yeah, evolution of ladies' hemlines over the past two centuries. Yeah, see, in 1805, they were ankle length or slightly above. And see, that's why like seeing them that long was strange. But it looks like there was a period between 1890 and 1910 where they were floor length. So we're right in the middle of that. So I guess that makes sense to see that picture. That's that's really interesting. Yeah, it looks like they got to about knee length in 1927. That was the flapper era, yeah? And then they stayed like between knee length and like ankles. They were like half length, yeah, for several, for a while. And they kind of vacillated between being, you know, a little closer to your ankles or closer to your knees. But they didn't really go above the knee until the 1970s. So that's what I'm seeing on this little graph. Well, I'm going to take a screenshot real quick and then uh, I can show it to you. This is from DustyOldThing.com. <laughs> cool. Um, evolution of ladies' headlines. Um, but I just think that's really interesting that that was like... A normal thing like it, it that's why I was surprised that it was so long because I'm used to seeing like from the 19th century they tended to have like shorter ankle length hemlines you could see your feet 
and you wouldn't trip over your dresses. You know? Like that's the idea. But uh, then it looks like it moved back to floor length. Ah, here's one from 1870 that's very similar. It's like, let's drag it on the ground, because, you know, that's a thing. And then 1880s, it went back up to ankle length. And, uh, and then in the 1890s, it went back down to floor length. And then women kind of stopped wearing skirts, so then it wasn't as uniform. That's interesting. Anyway, so I guess I learned something there. That this fashion was from the end of the 19th century, more than the beginning of the 20th. But, uh, wow, that, that long, long skirts, like that must have been super impractical. I don't think any of these dresses are something that I would feel comfortable wearing at home. And also they, they say like the well-dressed woman at middle age. Middle age, I think at that point would be around 40-ish. I'm in middle age. I mean, you know, like I, I personally wouldn't wear any of these, <laughs> but it's partly because I live in a different era and partly because um, I don't actually think that floor length dresses are ever a good idea. Like, unless it's literally a wedding dress, even my wedding dress was not floor length. Like, I think it was ankle length. I just don't think floor length dresses are a good idea. I just don't. Like, you you step on them, you know? You trip and fall. And that's not fun. Anyway, um, I learned a lot. I hope you did too. <laughs> and I hope this was fun to at least look at the old fashions and see what they used to do. I learned a few new words as well. So, thank you for joining me for this Microfusion microphone. And I hope to see you in the next video.